Hey guys, Edbud here and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm exploring Peabacks foam. What is it and why is it so good? After running hundreds of miles in shoes with a Peabacks based midsole foam, I've come to understand its intricacies. I've run loads of miles in ZoomX, Power Run PB, even the Float Ride midsole as well, which has got Peabacks. Left me wondering what is it about that foam that makes it so good? Why does it work so well? when used within running shoes. They always leave your legs feeling less fatigued, less beaten up. Muscles don't seem to take anywhere near the pounding as they do in other types of midsole foam. Don't get me wrong, I love fuel cell. I really like Boost. I've tried loads of other different midsole materials and some of them work exceptionally well. But there's something special about that Peabax material when used within running shoes right now. So let's explore some of the reasons why it's so good. So firstly, it's insanely light. Next percent in my UK size 11, clocks in at 224 grams, so that's about 7.9 ounces. So even those with larger feet benefit from that weight reduction. I asked Bound to make a difference over a marathon. Sometimes people suggest to me that I'm a bit obsessed about shoe weight and stuff, but I think over the course of a half marathon or higher, it's gonna make a difference, surely, if you're carrying less weight around. That just makes sense. So Nike suggests that the ZoomX foam used within their Vaporfly and Alphafly shoes has an energy return rate of 85%. I'm not sure what the difference is between that and React, but I do recall that the difference between Lunalon and React was about 13%. I would assume there's quite a difference between React and the ZoomX foam. So the midsole used in the 4% and the 4% Flyknit was suggested to have an 82% energy return. So there's a few percent leap between the 4% and 4% Flyknit and the next percent. Though I do recall some tests stating it was as high as 87%. So I think it's probably a little bit down to the runner's style, their efficiency. That study did in fact show that regardless of the runner's velocity, the Vaporfly 4% did in fact reduce the amount of energy required, or at least the energetic cost of running, by about 4%. Now, you could say it's marketing magic, or you might even suggest that Nike could have funded some of these things, but I think so many studies were produced, they all showed similar results. So in terms of a second key feature about this type of foam, I think it's very clear that it does reduce the energetic cost, or at least the amount of energy you're having to put in to get the results back out. That's not to say it's giving you energy, but it's certainly absorbing perhaps less of it, returning a little bit more of the energy you put in. That's how I see it anyway. So does that mean running in the Saucony Endorphin Pro, which uses a PBAX based midsole material, it's not ZoomX, but it's made of the same material, just in a different implementation, I suppose. Tuesday, seven miles at seven minutes, six seconds per mile, down to about six minutes, 54, I think, per mile at one point. Do these shoes help to minimize the amount of effort that I'm putting in? Perhaps is there a similar saving? It'll be really interesting to see if there is a study produced at some point that shows the saving using the Saucony Endorphin Pro. Third thing, is the reduction in recovery time needed. So the company Heel Lux suggests that the reduction in recovery times is one of the key features of this foam. That could be something to do with the improvement that it's offering. They suggest also that the term energy return should be perhaps changed to energy loss or perhaps reduction of energy loss. It got me thinking about other foams, you know, what sort of energy return does Boost have, for example? Boost has somewhere between 70 to 76% energy return. So it's not really that far away from the PBAX based midsole foam. Perhaps more though, it's about the speed of the foam's return to its shape, where it recovers from being compressed and then returns back to where it should be. Obviously a memory type foam here is completely out of the question, that wouldn't provide us with any real benefit whatsoever. Might be quite nice to sleep on though. Perhaps if you were stood in a stationary place for quite a while as well. Obviously we don't do that with running, so let's forget about that. So it does appear that the PBAX based midsole foams do lose the least energy in comparison to their competitors, or at least they return the most, I wouldn't say it's return, I think they lose them the least. Yeah, 
Let's go with that. Looking around online, when Nike released the Alpha Fly Next Percent, I think it was a member of staff in their footwear innovation section, suggested that the inclusion of the AirPods in the forefoot section of the Alpha Fly had a benefit in terms of the improved level of energy return. So they lose even less energy. Apparently these AirPods return 90% of the energy put into them. So, I mean, if you're talking about 80% in the Zoom X material and replacing that with something that does 90%, there's a bit of a saving. But, of course, this thing's heavier than the Zoom X material. So it must be a really careful balance between subbing out some of the Zoom X foam for this. It must be an advantage, possibly. I think the fifth thing I wanted to explore is the actual change in drop between the 4% or 4% Flyknit and the Alpha Fly Next Percent. We've gone for like a 10 mil drop in the 4% to a four mil drop in the Alpha Fly. Obviously that's to try and squeeze in a little bit more Zoom X foam because that seems to be one of the major things here that gives this shoe its unique ability. And we've got the Endorphin Pro here which is stuck with an eight mil drop. I'd suggest that's perhaps a little more preferable to people looking for a racing shoe, something they can go very fast in. Certain people don't really like it when there's a very flat or non-existent drop in a shoe. Doesn't seem to bother me that much. Be interesting to see which of these two shoes really holds up best over time in terms of its midsole and how it compresses. I got way over 50 miles in both of these shoes and no signs of them buckling under the pressure yet. I think it's important to remember that Reebok have been using p based materials in their Run Fast line, so the Run Fast 2 and the Run Fast Pro. Certainly helps reduce the weight. I really, really like training in both of these. This one, for example, has been my go-to daily shoe recently. It's just so lovely and light, wonderfully forgiving underfoot. But of course, the differences here are both of these lack that midsole stack height and also a carbon plate. Maybe that's something that Reebok are working on right now. So within the Run Fast 2 here, Reebok placed an EVA top to the PBAC based midsole. I mean, this shoe really does flex. It doesn't have anywhere near the rigidity that you find in the Vaporfly or Alphafly series. So the run fat, oh, it's so light. You almost feel there's nothing in your hand. Uh, 128 grams or 4.5 ounces in my UK size 11. I mean, that's 100 grams lighter than the Vaporfly Next Percent in my size. I mean, it's probably not a shoe for everybody, but if you're gonna run maybe a 5K, well, you could probably do some track work in this. It is the closest thing you'll find to a race flat. And there's reasonable cushion there. It's not like there's no cushion. It is really nice underfoot, but I think a perhaps more restricted use case for this shoe. Perhaps it would be a good carrier even for the use of a carbon plate in there somewhere. Who knows? That aside, I'm not sure these shoes are for everybody. Some people just find them far too unstable underfoot and thus some of the improvements that they grant simply aren't felt by some runners. An interesting website I stumbled upon was from the Balanced Runner. They have some very interesting views on runners form and how it kind of adapts and changes uh, over time and even within a race. I do go and recommend you check out some of the reports there, some really interesting stuff. Some really interesting articles there regarding Bridget Cosguy and how her form has changed over time, but also stating why form and strength at times is far more important than where the initial contact of your foot meets the floor. I mean, Bridget Cosguy utilized that Vaporfly next percent and achieved that incredible time recently. I say recently, it seems recent, but it was a little while back now. And they do talk a little bit about whether the next percent shoes have affected people's times, they've affected the records. I think you've got to say it's a technological innovation. It's something new. Nike have managed to develop the use of the foam and the carbon plate shape together and that seems to be the thing that's produced the improved results, along with the incredible, exceptional hard work of those athletes. Their ability and the technological innovation have pushed things forward. Whatever your stance is on p based foam materials in running shoes, I think there's certainly a huge number of advantages that they can bring, though I feel that at times they're not for everybody. It's just some of my musings. Tell me what you think about p based foam materials utilised in running shoes in the comments below. Musical interlude time. 
when my daughter was first born i can remember looking after her because her mother was not too well for the first couple of weeks and i tried everything to sort of pacify her and try and keep a very calm sort of mood in the house i used to play roy orbison songs to her and recently i dug back out a film actually that was shot uh, with roy orbison and loads of other really famous artists backing him up the black and white knight is a brilliant film i do suggest you go and check it out i mean you've got the likes of elvis costello there katie lang t-bone burnett sort of directing and producing everything and also bruce springsteen a very young bruce springsteen who looks almost starstruck that he's on the stage with his idol roy orbison tom waits is even there tinkling on the ivories there's some brilliant versions of some of roy's fantastic hits on it I do remember listening to The Comedians over and over again, which is this almost operatic ballad. It's just beautiful. It's not all ballads on there though, Roy does rock it up and show off some really good guitar chops actually. On Ooby Dooby is rocking rockabilly track and even performs one of his very old tracks, Go Go Go, down the line. But one of the best bits is where he does a version of Pretty Woman and there's a guitar duel between James Burton and Springsteen. Obviously, James Burton wins, but it's pretty awesome. So do go and check it out. Roy Orbison, The Black and White Knight. Thanks for tuning in and sticking with me to the very end of the video, guys. I very much appreciate it. Remember to hit that subscribe button and click the bell for notifications below of when new videos launch. And it helps the channel out a huge amount if you give this video a thumbs up and share this video with your running buddies. My name's Ed Bud, and I'll be seeing you.